Are real estate prices about to crash? Well, I'm gonna answer that question for you by showing you what I think everybody is missing when they're looking at real estate prices. There's a lot of people out there putting videos out, but I think that they're having problems looking at the right data. Now, if you don't look at the right data, you don't get to the right answers. Of course, none of us have a crystal ball, and all we can do is the best that we can with the data that we have, but you have to be looking at the right data. So in this video, I'm gonna break down what most people look at when they're thinking about the real estate market and if it's going to crash or if it will stay solid, what most people are looking at and how that's wrong and why it's wrong and what the real data is that we should be looking at it and what that data tells us and hopefully this will help you figure out what you should be doing with your real estate depending on where you live. So let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss and I make these videos to change the way you think about money because almost everything you've learned is wrong. And almost all the data that you're looking at is wrong because you're using faulty metrics. You're using manipulated data. And so I wanna peel this back. I wanna show you the right data to be looking at. The other thing that I wanna say is that, uh, oh, well, I got my new graphic up. Uh, trying to wake up the sleeping lions. If you don't believe this, if you don't catch it, it goes right over your, sh over your head. I guess I'm not trying to wake you up. Uh, I'm trying to get the lions. Now, I do wanna just give you some uh, perspective real quick before we dive in. It's gonna be a little bit of a long video because I got a ton of data that I wanna show you, all right? But I want you to understand that uh, there's a lot of nuance here. And this is the biggest problem that I see today, especially when it comes to money and investing. I just spoke at a, a big conference uh, at my good buddy George Gammon's conference, shout out to George, uh, which uh, George, I'm gonna show you why you're looking at the wrong data. <laughs> but uh, I was speaking at this conference and I said, hey, you know, what, what most people are lacking is the nuance with this. You're gonna hear people on different sides that agree, but you're gonna think they disagree because you don't understand the nuance in there. And it's important to understand the nuance because that's where we make the money. That's where we find our edges, in the nuance here. Now, the first thing I wanna say just to set this up, and I'm gonna show you examples of this, is that there is no such thing as the real estate market. There's no such thing as that. There's thousands of real estate markets, thousands and tens of thousands of markets broken down by property type and size and all different factors, all different areas, all right? So there's no such thing as the, there's thousands of markets and each of these factors will affect them differently, but let's go ahead and jump in. So the first thing, is the market gonna crash? Well, I'm gonna show you the data to show you this, but we do know that housing is in decline right now. We know that, okay? So we have facts on that. What we can see is that housing starts. So these are permits that are being pulled to build new houses. This is a leading indicator. If you're not pulling permits, then you're not building houses. If you're not building houses, there's no new houses being sold. That's pretty apparent, right? So we can see that residential starts declined by 14% last month. It's not a small decline, 14%. That is the lowest in more than one year. You can see this kind of highlighted here, a little bit of a decline right here. You can see this decline right here. Now, let's put this into perspective. Now, I'm gonna show you different charts, so hold with me here. But you can see we're all the way down here, which is still at a pretty high level compared to the last couple of years. Here, we've dropped all the way to here but we're still at a pretty high level. Now, as I tell you all the time, the reason why I like to show you the charts is it's not just the size of the move, we wanna see the direction, we also wanna see the, um, the speed in which that move is happening. So, 14%, okay, housing is declined, not necessarily a good thing to look at, let's keep that in mind. Okay, what else do we see? We can see that um, prices are dropping. Uh, this is uh, shares of Redfin and Zillow, so this is their stock doesn't really mean a whole lot, but the prices of those are coming down. Uh, no big deal, all the tech stocks are coming down. So we shouldn't even really be looking at that, but I'm just trying to show you all of this data. Now back to the housing stock, uh, the housing starts that have declined, I wanna give you a little bit of a bigger perspective. So this is going back all the way to 1960. So we have over 50 years of data. And so what we can see is the housing starts are coming down. They are, for sure. But this red line is about the average of where housing starts would be. And you can see we are nowhere near the average housing starts. We are still pretty high. And so, yes, they're coming down, but does that mean we're gonna crash? Are we below average? And the answer is certainly not. 
um, we can see here that this is a forecast. This is from Fortune magazine, and they're projecting U.S. home price growth. You see year over year from 2018, and the price of homes have gone up pretty steep. And now they're forecasting, this is Fannie Mae, so this is the government. Fannie Mae's forecast for 2022 is a 10% increase in home prices, and for 2023 is a 3% increase in home prices. So um, the change, the change, this is like CPI, the CPI, the change is going down, but it's, for, it's still forecasting for home prices to be going up just at a much slower pace. Now, um, again, we are seeing stuff soften, all right? So like I'm, I'm being real, we're gonna look at both sides of the argument here so you can get the best information that you need. And we can see during the four weeks that ended June 5th, 16% of listings in LA County had been uh, price cut to 7.5%. And what happens is when the market's going up, every new house is priced higher and higher and higher. And um, they're pricing, as we saw that exponential growth, so they're pricing higher and higher and higher. And eventually, as we showed you per Fannie Mae, instead of going up by 20% a year, they only go up by 10%. So people had priced their home 20% higher to get that 20% growth rate, but then it's not going to go up by 20%, it's gonna go up by 10% or even 3%. So they, they priced it 20% over market and now they just have to price it 3% over market. Doesn't mean prices are gonna crash, they're just marking their houses down to adjust for a more moderate increase. All right, well, let's look at some more data. Uh, prices are in a bubble. All prices are in a bubble. Everything is always in a bubble. What stage of the bubble could be a better question. So is it a bubble like this? Is it a bubble like this? Or is it a bubble like this? So everything's always in a bubble, of course, but let's take a look at this. So there's the Case-Shiller Index, and this is what everybody references. My good buddy George pulls this up on his real estate videos and shows you the Case-Shiller Index. We're gonna look at that uh, a little bit later. I'm gonna tell you why the Case-Shiller is a bad index to look at, and I'm gonna show you some adjusted numbers. But for now, this is the Case-Shiller Index for the housing. We can see going back to 1987, we can see this big bubble here in 2008. And per this, it looks like we are much higher and we are, the data shows that clearly, we are much higher than we were in 2008. However, is this the right data to look at? Well, we need to adjust it to get some real numbers, which we'll do that in a minute, but this is what the case Schiller shows us. All right, but there's other factors to think of. What we can see is, as I've already said, real estate has been going up astronomically. I showed you the chart. U.S. home prices rise at the fastest pace in 15 years. case Schiller index increased 11%. All right, so that's going up really, really fast. We know that. But I want to show you a couple charts, and then we're going to dig in a little bit. But this is per the Fed, Federal Reserve data, Fred data. And we can see, back to Case Shiller, so here's 2008, here's today. You can see that we have gone up. We've gone up by 60%. So home prices are 60% higher today than they were nationally on average, uh, are up 60% higher than they were in 2008. But there's one thing I'm gonna give you a hint and we're gonna come back to this, but this is the Fred <laughs> M2 money supply. So you heard that about 40% of all money in existence today was created in the last two years. So they create a bunch more money, which makes your dollars purchase less and less. So if you're only measuring in US dollars, you have to understand that US dollars are manipulated and so you have to adjust for that. So what we can see since 2008, look how many dollars have been created. Yeah, so you need to adjust home prices based off of the growth of the money supply. So we're gonna take a look at that. Now, a couple other things before we dig deep into this data I wanna show you. So we can see since January of 2000, so in the last 22 years, um, average home prices have gone up by 100%, so they've doubled, about doubled in 22 years. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. But remember, there's no such thing as the real estate market. There's thousands of markets. So this gives us a little bit of example. So this is the biggest home equity gainers by city of the top 10 metro areas over the last decade. Okay, for the last decade. Now, what we can see is we have three areas that are circled in red. All three of those areas are the same area. We have San Francisco, San Jose, and Oakland. Those are basically three of the same cities. Now, any reason why those three cities may have been the fastest growing in the nation over the last decade? Uh, Silicon Valley, yeah, that's where Silicon Valley is located. So think supply and demand. So when you have Silicon Valley and everybody's making billions of dollars and they're attracting the best talent and the, the average pay is going up and everybody's lived there, there's not a lot of houses there, what happens to those prices, supply and demand? People are making 
hundreds of millions of dollars. Probably salaries are 10, 20, 30 million dollars. What do they care if a house is one or two million? And so Silicon Valley has been the highest area in the nation. We had 92%, 98%, and 92%, where down here, Washington DC went up by only 27%. Supply and demand. There's thousands of markets broken down by all different types of factors. So I just kind of wanted to show you that before we keep going in the data so you can look at some of this nuance that's here. All right, now let's look at the last housing crash, which was 2008, and let's compare that to now to 2022. All right, now, first of all, um, <laughs> All right, I'll save that. Uh, so 2008 versus 2022, or let's say 2008 crash 2.0. So first thing to understand is that the 2008 great financial crash was a housing crash. So just like the 2000 market crash was the dot-com crash, that was the blow up of the dot-com boom, 2008 was the housing market crash. That's what it was specifically. Does that mean the next crash will be a housing crash or will it be a tech stock crash? or will be a student loan crash or a used car bubble crash. So let's take a look at that. So what was different? So in 2008, we had a big problem that mortgage-backed securities were became over leveraged. And so we had this massive market where the government were buying these mortgage-backed securities. They were um, bundling all these mortgage-backed securities into sausage, selling these all off in securities, and it became a massive, massive problem. There was a movie uh, made about it called The Big Short. Uh, highly recommended if you haven't watched it. It kind of breaks it down pretty good. But you can see the cause of the 2008 Great Financial Crash caused by deregulation in the financial industry that allowed the Wall Street to go hand crazy and do all these um, sausages with these mortgage-backed securities, um, blending them together so nobody knew what the risk was and selling them off and rehypothecating them and making a bunch of money. And then it, it made the appetite massive for this and so they started giving mortgages to anybody. We'll talk about that. It permitted banks to engage in hedge fund trading. So now they got super risky with these mortgages. The banks demanded more mortgages. We want more money. We'll do anything. We'll give a loan to anybody. We don't even care if you have a heartbeat. We're still going to give you a loan. And it created interest-only loans affordable to what's called subprime borrowers. Um, we got a little bit more right here. The Federal Reserve decreased interest rates from 6.5 to 1%. And so the banks could get money for basically free from the Federal Reserve and they could make that whole spread. They had never made so much money. They would, do, they would give it to everyone. Everyone starts to take out mortgages. People with low income and poor credit were accepted to these loans because Wall Street wanted these things. They wanted these mortgage-backed securities. They wanted to trade them off. Supply of housing goes through the roof as mortgage demand skyrockets, risky mortgages and the production of too many houses led to the demand decreasing as a result. So then there was so much demand, people were going and buying five houses, 10 houses in a new subdivision. They would stand in line to get their name placed to buy five houses. Who's gonna live in those five houses? And so then construction was overbuilt, all these things happened. And then people owned, uh, we'll skip that part. Okay, so you have to understand it was a lot different. What happened, was then we had overbuilt. We had nine worst recession ghost towns. So then throughout California where I'm at, through Phoenix, Las Vegas, also in Florida, you had entire towns that were built that nobody even lived there. Ghost towns, kind of like what happens in China. So we had way overbuilt. We had all these houses, all these construction companies. Nobody needed it. Nobody lived there. They were ghost cities. So we had everybody in the world, even without a pulse, had a mortgage or had five mortgages in, in a lot of cases. They had them all on adjustable rate mortgages that were very low. Wall Street packaged all these things up and created all these derivative products off of them and created this giant mess and we had this oversupply of houses nobody could even buy them anymore we were stuffed to the gills so you have to understand the situation was a lot different and of course when it crashed it was also a lot different we can see the average decline across the united states was 33 percent but it was different in different states so in california the average drop was 42 percent where i'm located in southern california it dropped 60 60 percent um, Florida dropped 50%, Arizona dropped 51% on average, but some of these states barely dropped at all. Nebraska, 5%. Oklahoma, 6%. The reason why I'm showing this to you is there's no such thing as the real estate market. You're asking me, Mark, should I sell my house? Should I buy a house? Where do you live? That's the first question. If you lived, even in the worst great financial crash, the real estate crash, if you lived in Arizona, on average, you lost 50%. That was tough. But if you lived in North, North, uh, North Dakota or Nebraska, you lost 
five percent. Five. So you got to understand there's a lot of nuance there. And the other thing I want to show you is this other chart right here is that um, I like to think of volatility being the difference of perception and reality. So the reality is, is that homes go up on average about 1.5% a year. That's this red line right here. That's the reality. Over a long period of time, they typically trend up. Nothing goes up or down in a straight line, but it goes up over time. The reality is this. Homes got oversold and then they got overbought and then they got oversold again. All right, so that is what happened with this. So we have to see where are we on that trend line today? Well, let's take a look at some of that data. Is this time different? Is 2022 going to have a repeat of 2008? Is it gonna be another housing crash? Or will it be something different? Well, let's take a look at this. So I like this little chart right here. Here's the millennials. They're all hoping that the market crashes because they want to buy a house. And I'm sure a lot of you watching this video can't even hear what I'm saying or look at the data because you just know 100% home prices are going to crash. So you can't even hear what I'm having to say. But let's just take a look at the data first, okay? So what we, what we know is that after the 2008 crisis, mortgages are safer because they're much harder to come by. No longer do we have this Wall Street game where they're bundling up these products and putting all these derivatives on them. No longer do we have people without heartbeats getting five homes. No longer do we have ghost cities being built like we had before. We don't have that. We can also see that the leverage in the system has been washed out. Similar to what I've been talking about in the crypto markets, you have to wash out all this leverage. And we can see this in this chart going back to 1920 right here. And what this shows us is the blue line is the federal debt and the orange line is the non-federal debt. And so this big, um, that big peak right there, that is right here in the 2007, 2008 bank banking crisis. And you can see that we've wiped out all that leverage out of the system and there's a little bit coming back, but we're nowhere levered like we were in 2008. And when you don't have a, a massive amount of leverage, you don't get liquidated easy. We're seeing this in the crypto markets firsthand. The other thing you have to keep in mind is that it's a completely different metric because all asset prices move off of supply and demand, always supply and demand. Now there's a trillion reasons why supply and demand can move, but we always go back to those two things. So what caused the great recession is complicated, but it's possible that insufficient supply was and still is a bigger problem than excessive demand. So what we had in 2008 was we had way too many houses. We had ghost cities, entire subdivisions in California, Arizona, um, Las Vegas, and Florida, entire subdivisions that people didn't live in. But yet today we have a different problem. America is short more than 5 million homes. They said, even if we build for the next decade, we probably won't be able to catch back up with the amount of homes that we need. So it's a big difference. Supply and demand, an oversupply. Now we have an undersupply. That's how things, the pendulum swings. It always overcorrects the other way. All right, so now that we've set all that up, you're all waiting for me to tell you, is real estate gonna crash or not? So let's dig into this. Now, uh, I got a picture of my good buddy George here, uh, and if you watch those videos, shout out to George, and uh, he always asks the question, is it cheap or expensive? Cheap, or if it's expensive. All right, we don't know. No one, no one can time the market. We don't try to buy things at the right time. We don't, we don't know when the top or the bottom is until we're looking backwards. What we do is we try to figure out when things are cheap, or when things are expensive. Now, George broke down real estate recently looking at the Case Shiller Index, but I think it was missing some of the data that we needed to look at. So we're gonna look at the right data that you need to look at, and we're gonna look at it from multiple indicators. Again, I don't have a crystal ball, but we're gonna try to figure out are things cheap or are things expensive, and we're gonna look at it with some corrected data. And so the first thing is the wrong metrics. What are the wrong metrics? Well, the wrong data to be looking at is Case Shiller. I guess that's one. That's one indicator you can look at, but you got to look at it the right way. Now, Case Shiller is wrong, in my opinion, for a couple of reasons. First of all, Case Shiller only tracks 20 out of 3,200 municipalities. So it says Case Shiller is seriously flawed. The primary index is based on only data from only 20 of the largest metropolitan areas, but there's over 3,100 areas. 
That's a problem. So there's 3,100 areas. Remember, there's no such thing as the real estate market. I showed you how some areas lost 5%, some lost 50%. So you can't just track 20 cities and just say, well, that's the market. It's 3,100. And they're broken down by price type, et cetera. All right, so that's a big problem. The other thing, especially now, because of what happened with the pandemic and, and the, the Zoom boom, we'll call it, people are now moving to Colorado and Wyoming and Idaho, places they wouldn't normally live because now they can work from their computer, they can work from online. And if you're only tracking the top 20 cities, you're not tracking Wyoming and Idaho. So you're missing the picture. So that's a big problem. And you can see that in some of the data right here. This is kind of a highlights uh, some of the areas that um, Case Schiller is tracking. But what if I want to move here? Or what if I want to move here? Or what if I want to move here? Or what if I want to move here? You see, the, the, there is no such thing as the real estate market. So that's one big thing. The other thing that I think is a big miss with Case Shiller, and I'm going to break this down in depth, but the big thing they miss is they miss interest rates. All right. Nobody buys the price of the house. They buy a payment. The payment is determined by the price of the house and the interest rate. So if all you do is look at the price of the house, you completely miss the interest rate. And what we can see is from the 80s, or more specifically here in uh, 2008, interest rates have gone down, 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 down. So that means that homes have gotten more expensive in total value, nominal value, but they've gotten cheaper in their payments. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. Oh, the other thing, it ignores input costs. Uh, you know, something called inflation. And so that means that the cost of goods to build the house went up. So that means lumber <laughs> went up, right? We saw that. I'm going to show you a chart on lumber. Lumber, windows, concrete, labor, it all went up in price. So you can't sell a house for less than it costs to build it. Um, if you're an appraiser, so if you want to buy a house, the bank sends out an appraiser. An appraiser has a couple different ways they can figure out what the value of that house is. One is looking at comparable sales, what are houses selling for around it, but also what's the replacement cost? What would it take to build that house today? You can't sell a house for less than it costs to build it, and so you have to take in input costs. Case okay, so doesn't look at that. And it also ignores money growth, money supply growth. So when they increase the money supply, it pushes prices up, so we have to look at that as well. So let's take a look at some of those factors so we can get the real data here. So what are the right metrics? Well, the first metric that we should really be looking at is not the total price of the house, but the affordability of the house. Now, this case Shiller also doesn't take into account if people's incomes go up. So we want to look at the affordability, which takes all that into consideration. Okay, I already showed you this chart. So remember the affordability. Nobody buys the price of the house. What they buy is a payment. What we can see is per um, FHA, we see um, conventional and FHA mortgage together, 90% of home purchases are financed. So hypothetically, I haven't worked out the math, but um, let's say that you can buy a $500,000 house now for a $3,500 payment. I'm going to wait until the price of the home goes drops to 350 because I just know it will. Um, but let's say interest rates go up. And um, I buy the house for 350, but my payment's still 3,500 because interest rates went up. So now I bought it at 500, you bought it at 350, but we both pay 3,500 a month for 30 years, which means we both pay the same amount for the house, regardless of what the purchase price was for the house. Now, if you pay cash, it's totally different. Don't get me wrong, but less than 10% of people do that. You can see a, a picture of that here, and we can see. Another better illustration of that, if you had $1,000, how much house can you buy with $1,000? Now, I've gone ahead and highlighted this big area right here. This is the 2008 peak that we had before. And what we can see, this red line, is that we can buy more and more house with $1,000. So it's the affordability. The same $1,000 buys me more and more and more and more house. So even though the price of the homes went from 350 to 500,000, it doesn't mean they're more expensive because my monthly payment stayed the same. Remember, it's the affordability. That's the biggest piece that I think everybody is missing. Now we can see it in a couple other ways. Um, so this is the affordability index right here. This is in Canada. And you can see that the payments have stayed about the same. And if we're not paying the total price of the house, if we're only paying the monthly payment, then that's what we should really be looking at. So here's a Case Shiller index that I like a lot better. This is real monthly mortgage payments. 
and this is adjusted for inflation. So remember, we also increased the money supply. So we need to not look at the price of the house, we need to look at the payment of the house, and we need to adjust that payment for inflation. Now, a better way to do it would also be to adjust it for income growth. I don't have that data. But what we can see, going back here to 1986, what we can see is that the affordability has actually stayed about the same. Here's 2008, when we had this big bubble, what we can see is in regards to the monthly payment, we're actually below the trend line. A little bit different. Now that's in the United States. If you're in Canada, don't worry, I got your back. You got about the same thing. Here's Vancouver, it's a little bit high. Toronto's in red. Canada overall here is Montreal is down here. So we're low in Canada as far as the payments go, which is exactly what people pay. Now we also have different metrics to look at as well. So remember, the money supply is manipulated. So we have to look at things priced in other things besides dollars. And so look at this chart right here. This is real estate to gold ratio. So this goes back to 1950. And so you can see it stayed about the same because we were on a gold standard, obviously. 1971, homes got cheaper in gold. And you can see that homes priced in gold have actually stayed pretty flat. Only in US dollars they've gotten more expensive. Not in gold. Uh, we can look at it another way. Here is actually from the Federal Reserve data from Fred. This is the S&P Case-Shiller US National Home Price Index um, with M2, divided by M2. So here we have the home index divided by the money supply. Remember, the money supply is increasing. So what we can see here is we can see this price has dropped off of a cliff here when you divide it by the money supply. It's an inverse correlation. So you can see it's a little bit different. And then, of course, we have the input cost. Remember that. We talked about um, it gets more expensive to build houses, and you can't sell a house for less than you can build it. And so that's what appraisers would use, the replacement cost. So here we have lumber. Now, lumber went way up crazy high and it has since come down but look it's still way over its historical levels of where it was back here in the last uh, housing boom in 2008 so it's way more expensive to build a house today than it was in 2008 so is it cheap or is it expensive and you can see here remember supply and demand the housing shortage is worse than ever will take a decade of record construction to fix this problem experts say all right, so finally, are we going to have a crash of real estate prices or could we have a correction of real estate prices? So things have been going up like crazy. Fannie Mae, the government, forecast that prices will still go up, but much slower. Instead of going up at 20% a year, they're gonna go up half as slow at 10% a year and then at 3% a year. So they will decelerate, which is why you're seeing people on Redfin marking their houses down. As I said, they priced them for a 20% gain, but now they need to price them for a three to five or 10% gain. So will we have a crash or could we have a, a correction? Now, you know, we talk about different financial assets all the time. Whenever you go on a parabolic run, you make up 100% or 200% gain, you're due for a correction. No markets go up or down in a straight line, period. And we know that when markets go up that fast, that it's healthy to have a correction. If we look at other markets, we see this all the time and it doesn't seem to be a big deal. Here's a chart of the S&P 500. This is the main stock index that everybody uses. We know we've been on the longest bull run in history. So here's the 2008 crash. Prices dropped 60% in the stock market. But since then, we've been on a parabolic run. Look at that. But has it really been? Because here we have a 21% correction. This is probably about a 20% correction. We have a 21% correction. We have a 16% correction. We have a 20% correction. We have a 35% correction. You see, nothing goes up in a straight line. It looks like a straight line when you zoom out, but you see it moves up and down. So if homes go up by 100%, and they have a little, a little correction, is that a crash? What do you define a crash as? So if homes actually dropped more than 25%, is that a crash? Is 30% a crash? Is 50% a crash? So how do we define it, first of all, and what's the difference of a correction or a crash? Now, I would say that we wanna look at supply and demand, okay? So one, as we know, housing starts are down, but they're up 
big time historically. So supply and demand. Well, we also know, and this is a very key piece, so now this is for you. Where do you live in the country? Are you in, uh, are you in North Dakota where prices went 5% down or are you in Arizona where they went down 50%? So where are you? Are you in Silicon Valley where they went up by 100% or are you somewhere else where they went up by 20%? So where are you? What we can see, remember supply and demand, is we can see in Florida, New Yorkers and Californians are flocking to Florida. So there's massive outflows and then there's massive inflows. So if you're in a state that's getting massive inflows, even though prices are expensive in Florida, they're cheap if you're coming from New York or California, they're cheap. And so there's massive inflows there. And at the same time, as there's massive inflows there, there's massive outflows in New York. New York has, uh, has Matt, listen up New York, Florida sucks and you'll be back in five years, probably not. I think most people end up liking it there. Now we can see this in a chart, I have a couple charts for you, don't worry. This is the combined areas with the largest net domestic migration increases. And so what do we have? Florida has the most. We can see the amount of, of increases here. This is also Florida, Daytona, Florida, 55,000 here, 38,000 here, 36,000 there. We also have Tennessee, we have Georgia, we have Georgia. Uh, I don't see any New Yorks on there, I see Utah. Then we have areas that have outflows. So this is the areas that have the, the most outflows and we can see, oh yeah, wouldn't you guess it? New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Pennsylvania have a net outflow of 377,000. So if you're in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or Pennsylvania, you might see your prices going down. If you're in San Jose, San Francisco, or Oakland, remember those had the biggest gains, 100% gains, they have the second highest outflows of 182,000. So if you're in Silicon Valley, your houses could probably go down. If you're in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, your houses could probably go down. However, if you're in places that have increases, then you could be doing pretty good which we also have here. We have Salt Lake City, Provo, Utah. We have Boise, uh, Idaho. We have, uh, oh, we got Sacramento, Roseville, California. We got Tennessee. We got Fresno, California, surprisingly. We got Georgia, Ohio, and we got Jacksonville, Georgia. So Florida, Georgia is looking the best. Texas is looking pretty good as well. So those areas will do better, some will do worse. Supply and demand, figure out where you're at. What is the demand? Is it going to increase? Is it gonna decrease? I would say overall, I'm betting that we have a correction and not a, uh, I say we have a correction and not a crash. That's my opinion. I don't think we'll see prices dropping by that far nationally. Some areas we will, some areas will continue to go up, but what do you think? Leave me a comment down below. I can't wait to see what you guys say. You know I worked really hard on this video. I dug deep. It's not easy to get this real estate data, so hopefully you give me a thumbs up if you like it and subscribe to the channel. If you don't like it, that's okay. Give me a thumbs down, but at least tell me why. And that's what I got for today. All right, to your success, I'm out. Since you've stayed to the end, I know you like this video, which means you're probably gonna really like this video right here and this video right here.